praise the Lord to reach Pastor Priscilla Hall. Let us go to the throne of grace. Eternal Heavenly Father, once again, we stand in your presence, honoring you of being Father, our Father, the one who we can call upon in the midnight hour, any day, any time. You're always available, watching, listening, and answering prayers according to your will. We thank you for the comfort. We thank you for the love. We thank you for your mercy and your grace and the peace that surpasses all understanding. Father, we thank you for your kingdom that's not in words, but in power of the Holy Spirit. That's not in meat or drink, but is in your righteousness, in your peace, and in your joy of the Holy Spirit. Oh, we thank you for your wisdom, God, that far excels human imagination. But when the enemy comes in like a flood, you'll raise up a standard that nothing is too hard for you. Because you are the Lord of Lord and the King of King. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 How many of you know you can call on Father whenever you need him? I'm talking about a heavenly Father. I'm talking about the born again Father. The one that's able to do all things. I'm talking about a heavenly father that wants to give you peace and comfort. That wants to endow you with wisdom that is not like the ways of this world. That the natural mind cannot comprehend. Because this father is spiritually discerning. It's an internal manifestation of his presence through the Holy Spirit. The one that's able. Ah, yes. I don't care what you're going through. This father is able. Yes. Yes. Just meditate on this father. Yes. Hallelujah. If you're going to call on anyone, call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who's high and lifted up and who's able to do all that he said he could do. I'm going to be coming from the writings of Jeremiah. The writing of Jeremiah. And I'm going to lift up one special scripture so that we can meditate on that all week. Jeremiah 32, 27, and it reads as thus. You may stand for the reading of his word. You may kneel for the reading of his word, however you feel the desire to do so. But know one thing, his word is pure and true and holy and righteous and just, and his word will stand forever. Let us get ready to partake of his word. Aren't you glad 
and that God is omnipresent and he's not in foolishness. It's not where you're from or where you're going. It's who you have committed your life into, who you belongs to. A God is omnipresent. Don't fall for the folly of this world. So you assume, be consumed by the foolishness of sin. Jeremiah 32, 27 reads as thus. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Is there anything too hard for me? Jeremiah was in prison and he was complaining to God. The captivity that he had found himself in, he was not pleased with. He understood that God was mighty and he was the Lord of all hosts, that he had loving kindness even despite of the captivity for disobedience. But he also understood that God would promise him a glorious return. Is there anything too hard for me? God omnipotent and his ability to accomplish anything, emphasizing that nothing is too difficult for him. It's a message of hope and assurance that no matter the circumstances, God has the power to work miracles and fulfill his promises. I remember when they asked, was there anything good that could come out of Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth? That was humanity's lack of understanding that it wasn't about where Jesus was born. For he wasn't born in Nazareth. But he was known as Jesus of Nazareth where they were located. But he wasn't born from flesh and blood. He was born out of the will of God as precognate. And so his birth was like no other. And in this journey through the Bible, where God is declaring and Jeremiah put an end of all humanity's flesh to take away all humanity's natural mind their thinking and their natural us that is already lost because you can only win in the spiritual realm of God. He says, behold, I am the Lord. I'm the God of all flesh. Makes no difference where you think you're from. Makes no difference where you think you are. Makes no difference who you think you are. I'm the God of all flesh. And my question to you is, is there anything too hard for me? You can get in your division if you want to, but I'm here to tell you, I'm not in it. I'm dealing with a God that's a God of all flesh. I don't have anything else to deal with. He's omnipotent and he declares that. But what he's making assurance is that this is the God that can work miracles and fulfill all of his promises. So don't put me in your personal agendas and differences, just like I'm not your parties with politics. I'm not your location with human flesh with personal agendas. I'm not getting in it because there's no room for it in the kingdom of God. If the kingdom of God is not about your food, nor your drink, nor your word, but by his righteousness, his peace, his joy, and his power, then I'm going to uphold under God's kingdom. Because God's kingdom truly 
can take care of itself. Some of y'all are wasting your time on things that God knows. It can't save you. It can't keep you. It can't present you. And it's meaningless. Because you got to be born again. So I'm focusing on the spiritual side of the God's. The Bible goes on to say that in Jeremiah. He was talking about a national funeral. Portraying, portraying the capture and destruction of Jerusalem. Now, isn't it strange that we're in a war over, not actually United States, but Israeli and Hasmas is in a war. And they're right there in Israel. But you have the West. And then you have the Jerusalem city, they're all right there in the same location. And when a war breaks out, often any other nation or city in that area might be affected. And by them being affected, Jerusalem is there. but they're not fighting this war. Egypt is on the borders of Gaza where they need to get through to bring the humanitarian supplies into Gaza who have lost their electricity, their water supply and their food accessibility. Jerusalem is further up from Israel more near the area of the West area that you will often hear about or see on the map. But nevertheless, Jerusalem is not a part of this, but they will be impacted if rockets land in their jurisdiction or go over the head of where they're at. So war affects everybody, whether you're initially engaged in it or you're in the vicinity where a war happens. Aren't you glad that God is the ultimate authority of all? And not only is he the ultimate authority of all, he's the source of it all. Because you're fighting over power. And while these nations are fighting over power, you have a lot of people that fight over power. Personal agendas that really has nothing to do with nothing when it's all said and done at the matter of the conclusion. Where we have to fear God, keep his commandments, and know that he will judge all things seen and unseen, whether it be good or evil, according to a wise king in his younger days who realized without wisdom, everything we say and do is folly. Even whatever we behold. So when we remind ourselves about Jeremiah and how God makes himself known, behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? I don't know what somebody's trying to satisfy or initiate, but I've been preaching and teaching the word of God for over 40 years. And nobody has ever identified me by what I wear, by colors, by where I go or what I do. 
nor by what I drive. I've always been identified by the Lord, the Christ Jesus that's within me. But I guess as you have people that establishes their own agendas and they get in other people's agendas, they'll begin to identify by whatever they're working on. Well, I'm here to tell you that God says he's a spirit. And if you're going to identify God, you're going to identify God based on his spirit. That God says he's the Lord God, the God of all flesh. So if you're going to identify God, you're not going to identify God with flesh. You're going to identify God with him being omnipotent, omniscient and omnipresent. Something flesh can never be omnipotent, omniscient nor omnipresent. And you're going to identify God that there's nothing too hard for him. Something that flesh can never say. I like how God declares that there's nothing too hard for him. In other words, he was letting the inhabitant who were given into the hands of the Chaldeans by God that nothing was too hard for God to bring them out in due time. You see, verse 28 says, Therefore said the Lord, Behold, I will give this city unto the hand of the Chaldeans and into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall take it. And the Chaldeans that fight against the city shall come and set fire on this city and burn it with houses upon whose roofs they have offered incense unto Baal and poured out drink offerings into other gods to make, provoke me to anger. Because of all the evil, and they have provoked me to anger, their kings, their princes, their priests, their prophets, all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, they have turned their back and not their face. Even though I taught them and continue to teach, they have not hearkened unto me. They have become an abomination in my house. Verse 34. They are called by my name, but they have defiled me. They built high places of Baal. They've given their sons and daughters to Molech, which I've commanded them not to do. And it shall be delivered unto them the hand of the king of Babylon by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. In this writing in Jeremiah, God is allowing the people to know that there is nothing too hard for him to do as far as changing powers from one hand to another hand, from the Chaldeans to the Babylonians. because of their disobedience. A war was threatened. And the war was being allowed because of their disobedience. That's why the Bible says, if your ways are pleasing unto the Lord, he can make your enemies even be at peace. Because there's nothing too hard for God. He has the ability to control all flesh. And we forget 
He's the God of all flesh. As well as the God of all spirits. That's why there's nothing too hard for him. If you are in need of something, you don't go to flesh, you go to God. If you are in desire of something, you don't go to flesh, you go to God. If you're seeking wisdom, God has it. If you're seeking knowledge, God has it. If you're seeking understanding, God has it. If you're seeking rest and peace and joy and prosperity, God has it. For nothing is too hard for God. Let us meditate on chapter 32 where God sets the stage for why he has rejected their ways because of apostasy falling away and have allowed war to transgress upon them to switch the powers to be from the hands of the Chaldeans where God had given them into the hand of the Chaldeans to soon be in the hand of the Babylonians where they will experience sword, famine, and pestilence because of God's fierce anger, his fury toward them for their lack of respect. But God says, I'm going to bring you again into this place and I will cause you to dwell safely and you shall be my people and I will be your God. After you go through a great wrath, after you go through my great anger and after you go through my great fury, There are consequences based on our actions. Now, whose consequences do you want? The consequences of humanity? It is better to obey God than humanity. Or the consequences of God. So after a while, once God has disciplined them again from the Chaldeans to the Babylonians. Then he makes an everlasting covenant in verse 40 of 32. He said, I won't turn away from you to do good, but I will put my fear in your heart that you shall never depart from me. I will rejoice over you to do good. And I will plant you in a land assuredly with my whole heart and with my whole soul. For I am the Lord, like as I have brought all this great evil upon this people. Verse 42. So will I bring upon them all the good that I have promised them. The fields shall be bought in this land, whereof you say, it is desolate, without man or beast. It is given into the hand of the Chaldeans. Men shall buy fields for money and subscribe evidences and seal them and take witness in the land of Benjamin and in the places about Jerusalem and in the cities of Judah and in the cities of mountains, and in the cities of the valley, and in the cities of the south. For I will cause their captivity to return, said if the Lord. Behold, verse 27, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? There's something about God 
that he's proclaiming that there is nothing too hard for him. He's sincere about chastising those he loves. He's sincere about bringing judgment upon all actions seen and unseen. He's sincere about proclaiming that he's above all flesh. I know some of your flesh want to be above God because you just won't relinquish your will. Always finding something to make it about that God never gave you authority to even declare or make it about. Always trying to tell others what you won't even receive the truth from God about yourself first. And so God had to let these people go into captivity to teach them a lesson. To teach them a lesson about who he is. To teach them a lesson about there's nothing too hard for God. And he will allow evil to teach you a lesson. He will allow evil to come upon you in wars and pestilence and famine. God's wrath. Because of disobedience. But he has an everlasting covenant. that he will bestow upon you his loving kindness, his goodness, his steadfastness, his favor, and his blessings. But although God bless, he also chastens those that he loves. Don't ever get to a point where you don't take God serious. You see, one thing about these kingdoms and nations that they learned the seriousness of God because God will allow his people to be placed in one hand and then take them and place them in another hand. And each time God is chastening, disciplining, and showing his people, he means business. If you turn your heart from it, if you turn your back on it, if you lose your teaching and don't hold to what he's instructed you, he's going to set you aside like an abomination because you've defiled his name and defiled his place of habitation. He's going to allow you to conduct yourself Ways that are unbecoming to him because you chose those ways as more pleasing, more desirable than pleasing and desiring God. God is not going to argue with you. He's not going to fight with you. He'll let evil do that. He's not going to plead with you. He's not going to beg with you. He'll let evil consume you. And after you learn the hand, the rod of evil, you're going to want God. And when you want God and you desire to return back to God, you're going to experience the loving kindness of God. You can play with God all you want to. You can dishonor God all you want to. You can disrespect God all you want to. You can try to have your will and try to control what God never gave you authority to do. And you will experience the wrath of God because God is not a God that will not allow his judgment to fall upon your life. How well Jeremiah learned this. Just in this one chapter of 32, you can make this about money all you want, or you can make it about the heart of God, because the bottom line, you can't own a dime unless God allow you to own it, and you won't even live long enough to be able to spend it if you're not living right for God. 
You better be careful how you are prioritizing what God is never prioritizing. You better be careful how you are trying to define, entangle, mark, and set up your kingdom over God's kingdom because God doesn't need your permission. God doesn't care where you're from. He doesn't care who your mother, your father, or any of your siblings are. You better know the God that saved you, sanctified you, and gave you your very breath. You better know who God is. This is the Lord God that's over all flesh. And you better stop edifying flesh over this God. You better stop telling God what you got. And you better start asking God, can you? Because except God gives you the authority, you don't have the authority you think you got. Authority is not coming from human. It's coming from God. And the problem with God, people, they were taking authority from people. But when God steps in, and showed you who has the ultimate authority of all creation, then you learn the hand of God, how he uses evil and wickedness to discipline your lack of humility and humbleness before a holy and righteous God. He says, I'm the one that's omniscient. I'm the one that's omnipotent. I'm the one that's omnipresent. And who did you say you are? I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. You used my name, but I didn't. Consecrate your actions. You used my name, but I didn't authorize your work. You use my name, but I don't know you. Oh, I know everything, but I don't have a relationship with you. You're just using my name to try to get spiritual gain, but that's impossible because you've not obeyed my voice. You don't walk in my way. You don't honor my law. You're more concerned about flesh over me. And so because you want flesh, I'm going to give you flesh. You want what the world is telling you, I'm going to give it to you. Until you learn how to come to me for my provision, I'm going to let the word orchestrate your life. Until you learn, they don't know what I know. Until you learn, they don't have what I have. Until you learn my godliness that is profitable to all. Until you learn my godly fear that will lead and guide you into a righteousness. Until you learn my everlasting covenant that will provide protect until you learn my divine consistency until you learn my goodness until you learn my steadfastness until you learn my divine aid until you learn my restoration and until you understand my blessings that can only come from me I have a wrath that's above all flesh and principalities and spiritual wickedness and rulers in high places. I can send a famine and a pestilence and I've many times have executed my righteous judgment upon my creation. I am the Lord God. You better behold me. You better know who I am. Some of you are too worried about knowing somebody else. 
but you better know who I am because I'm the God of all flesh and there's none like me. There is nothing too hard for me. I will bring help and cure and reveal. I bring abundance of peace and truth. You better know who provides abundantly. You better know who can withhold all things from flesh. So God promises a gracious return where the branch of righteousness would restore his people back to him. Is anything too hard for God? Don't let no one define you by what God has never defined you. And when people speak that to you, you let them know. You're honoring God and not them. That their ways mean nothing to you. They draw close to God with their mouth, but their heart is far from God by what they say out of their mouth that doesn't align with the heart of God. This is about who God is. The Lord of all flesh. And you've forgotten God. You're not dealing with Jesus of Nazareth. You're dealing with Jesus, the son of God. That was pre-existent. He existed before Nazareth existed. He created Nazareth, the land. So don't ever define him by a land. He's the God here. He existed before you. So don't ever treat him like he came after you or like you can control him. You submit to his will. He doesn't submit to yours. You're beneath him, not above. And you need a renewed heart to accept the ways of God. Because the longer you stay in your own way, the further you fall away from the ways of God. He's a spirit. And he operates according to his spirit, a holy spirit, a righteous spirit, a faithful spirit. An everlasting spirit, a profitable spirit of godliness. And colors has nothing to do with godliness. Godliness is an attribute from God. Holiness is an attribute from God. Don't align God with the things of this world. He's hiding. He has not been created by humanity's hands. That's why some people, you have to let them know. Your trust is in God, not you. And people who have little faith, they always want you to trust their way. Because that's what they hold on to. That's how they got in it in the first place. Holding on to trust and flesh, but not God. And then they can't understand why God ain't moving over their life. Because God didn't tell them 
flesh did. And God only upholds what he says, not what flesh says. So you wonder why it's not being executed. No, God is not a liar. Flesh is. God never said. Flesh said. God never promised it. Flesh promised it. God fulfills all of his promises. Who are you putting your faith and trust in? Because it's not God. You need to start telling these people, where did God say that? Where are you getting your information from? Because it's not coming from God. You see, that's why you had these people going through captivity. They didn't listen to God. They listened to people. They turned their back on God. That was their choice. They turned their face away from God. That was their choice. They decided to leave the teaching of God. That was their choice. They decided not to receive the instruction from God. That was their choice. They decided to be an abomination unto God. That was their choice. They decided to have their daughters and sons be offered to Moloch. That was their choice. They decided not to obey the commandment of God and be an abomination. That was their choice. And so God brought captivity from the hands of Babylonia against them. That was God's choice. When you want to walk away from God and tell God and other people what God never authorized and told you, then you are lying on God and even to yourself. Which means you're being held accountable for pushing an agenda that God never told you to push and uphold. Some of you better be careful what's being pushed your way as an agenda that God never authorized. Don't identify me by what God never identified me by. That'll change. But God never changes. That's the ways of the world. But God is not the ways of the world. That's how you get into wrong identification. Peculiar people are not identified like the ways of the world. That's why they're peculiar. A holy nation is not identified by the ways of the world. That's why it's holiness. Holiness is not worldliness. And you can't take worldliness and identify holiness with worldliness terms. That's not the ways. That's not the actions. That's not the correlationship. That's not the description of holiness unto God. That's not the vocabulary. That's not the mannerism. That's not the demonstration. That's not the consecration. Nor is that the validation. Nor is it God's instructions. That's all contrary to what God has been saying from the very beginning of creation. He didn't give Adam and Eve a description. He gave Adam and Eve instructions. And the instruction was, do not. And some of you are given descriptions that has nothing to do with instructions. A commandment not to. You can't partake of everybody's 
instruct, nor descriptions. Because everybody destruct inscriptions, instructions, and descriptions are not godliness. They're worldliness. And you need to know the difference between God's godliness and worldliness from flesh. That's why he said, I'm the God of all flesh. Behold who I am. Don't listen to flesh. Listen to me, the God of all flesh. Know my voice. Know my ways. Don't put on the ways of this world. Don't identify yourself with worldliness if you are part of my kingdom. If you are part of my kingdom, I'm God. I'm Lord. There's no one higher no one else is authorized to make any commandment be fulfilled but me. If you're part of my kingdom, you're born again. And there's nothing too hard that I can do. If you're part of my kingdom, you won't accept what's not a part of my kingdom because you know your kingdom works. If you're a part of my kingdom, you won't be viewing yourself by where you're from. You'll be viewing yourself by where you're going. You see, the Israelites were taken into captivity. They were in Chaldean. That's not who they are. That's wickedness and unrighteousness that God used to discipline them. Then they were taken into the Babylonians. That's not who they are. That's wickedness and unrighteousness that God was using to discipline them. So it wasn't about where they're at or where they came from. It's where he's taking them to keep them in conformity to who their God is. Their identity is who your God is. Your identity is who your God is. Who's on your throne? Who's the captain of your soul? Who you identify yourself with? Who forms your thoughts? Who gives you your instruction? Who authorizes your words? Who you bow before? Who you desire to please? Who you commune with, who you communicate with, who you obey, that's your identity. Who's your God? In other words, Jesus' God was not Nazareth, a lamb. Jesus' God was the Father, a spirit that anybody can occupy a lane. But everybody can't occupy his spirit. And a land will soon be gone, destroyed. But his spirit will last eternity. And so he had to teach them the very simplicity of life Don't provoke God. And some of you don't think God can't be provoked to anger. Well, Jeremiah 32 shows you what can provoke God to anger. And you don't want to provoke God to anger. Because this is the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. He's quite often provoked to anger. When you begin to act like the adversaries 
children. When you act wicked and evil. When your father becomes the father of lies. Wickedness. Abomination. Ungodliness. Unholiness. And you take pleasures in such acts. God is provoked unto anger. When we do things unbecomingly that are evil, whether it's spoken or done with our hands, God is provoked unto anger. Just like God tells us not to provoke one another except unto love and to do good. He tells us don't provoke God with your wickedness, your unrighteousness, because he's going to judge. He's going to judge your wicked and evilness. And in this place, it became a city unto him as provocation, anger, and fury. And the day of judgment came upon him. Now, when the Lord returns, if you're here to live long enough, you're going to experience the provocation of God. He's not coming back in meekness. You'll never put him back on the cross. He's coming back in provocation. There's going to be a fury, a righteous indignation and anger. And he's coming back to destroy the world. There's going to be a fear that many are going to tremble and bow and profess who he is out of fear. Because he's coming back to destroy the world after years of provocation. After years of unrighteousness. After years of walking and leaving his teaching. Disobeying his instructions. Not honoring him. Trying to have your self-will. Lying in his name. Doing things to one another that's just unacceptable. The Bible says he's returning. In theory. He's returning in provocation. When he's ready to destroy this world. That's why many are going to be hiding and running. They're not going to be coming to him because they're going to be afraid. Of because they know their works were works of evil and not good. They know he's going to judge righteously. They know they've been aligned with Satan and the devil's words. And he's coming to destroy the earth for the defilement that has been allowed to permeate. But the saints would have patience and they're going to keep his commandments and remain faithful into Jesus Christ. So they won't be fearful. They're going to want to see him face to face. They're going to fall at his feet in reverence. They're going to desire his appearance. They're going to be happy to see him. But the disobedience, they're going to be in torment and terror. Because their hearts was not fulfilled in his will. They didn't agree with his kingdom principle. They didn't fulfill his commandment that he left for instruction. They became an abomination. 
almost like Adam and Eve when they ran and hid from. They knew they were wrong and they were fearful of him. You see, fear is not the reverence fear, but this is a torment fear because perfect love casts out all fear. But Adam and Eve had a torment fear because they knew they disobeyed God. There's a different fear when God gets ready to return and you are made known that you disobeyed. You chose to disobey. You chose to be partake of sin and not partake of his holiness. And there be no finger point. You see his fierceness and the wrath of the almighty God. According to Revelation 19, 15. He said a sharp sword is going to come out of his mouth. And he's going to smite the nations. And he shall rule with a rod of iron. And fierceness and wrath of the almighty God shall go forth. And you will know this is the king of king and the Lord of Lord. I don't know about you, but I hope I live long enough to be able to see him when he returns. I would like to see him appear from the clouds and place his feet upon the earth. I would like to be able to bow at his feet and holy reverence, glad that he returned, glad that he's destroying the wickedness that has been allowed to permeate, glad that he's faithful and true and pure and honest. And he's coming to avenge the saints for all the wrongdoing that have been done. Glad that he's showing them. He's always been the Lord of all flesh. He's always been the Lord over all principalities. He's always been the sovereign God over creation, the final authority, the source of all things. Glad that he's coming back with a reward to those who loved him, who stayed committed to him, who understood that he's Omega in the beginning, the Alpha and the end. You know how we say Alpha and Omega beginning and the end? You know, Alpha's the beginning, Omega's the end. He's the first and the last. He's the tree of life. He has the right to take us in to the whole city. Glad that he's returning back in the spirit of his power. Glad that he's bringing all things to end and showing his glorious power. I don't know about you, but I would like to see him face to face. I would like to to hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. I would like to just behold him and see his radiance glory. I would like to say, Lord, you said you will return. And hear the angels cry, holy, 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 holy. And the dead in Christ shall rise. And those who remain shall be caught up in the rapture. And we shall behold him. I would like to behold him. See, now he's saying in Jehovah, Jeremiah 32, 37, behold. He's giving you a foreshadow of the behold. The behold when he returns in Revelation. He said, behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Then he asked a very profound question. Is there anything too hard for me? I don't know about you, but I've never felt nothing too hard for God. For whenever I had a need, God always fulfilled. 
Whenever I had a concern, God always came through. Whenever I needed a healing, God was able to heal. Whenever I needed assistance, God was able to assist. Whenever I needed direction, God was always able to direct me. Whenever I needed instruction, God was always able to instruct me. Whenever I needed comfort, God was there to give me comfort. Whenever I needed peace, God was there to give me peace. Whenever I needed joy, God was there to give me joy. Whenever I needed prosperity, God was there to give me prosperity. Whatever I had need of, God always provided. I don't know about you, but there was nothing ever too hard for God. I haven't found nothing that God can't do. Nothing. Nothing. Whenever I needed resolution, he was able to bring resolution to the situation. There is nothing too hard for my God. Ah, la, 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 la. Whenever I needed him to fight a battle, he never lost the battle. My king of glory, who's strong and mighty, mighty in battle. Whenever I needed a mind regulator, he kept my mind. Yes, kept me in a sound mind. Whose report are you going to believe? Are you going to believe the Lord, the God of all flesh, that there's nothing too hard for him? Or are you going to believe flesh and lower spirit that is nothing compared to God? Whatever God wanted me to do or be, he always provides. There's nothing too hard for God. See, I don't know about you, but I'm not in your daycare field. I'm not dealing with your kids. I'm dealing with mature Christians. And God is sending a message. Don't provoke him. Don't provoke him with nonsense. Don't provoke him with folly. Don't provoke him with unrighteousness. Don't provoke him with taking him lightly. Don't provoke him. Because he's not a God to be mocked. He's the God that's above all flesh. And nothing is too hard for him. I don't care what flesh shame. What does God say? Nothing's too hard for God. I don't care what flesh think. What are the thoughts of God? Nothing's too hard for God. I don't care what flesh do. What are the works of God? Nothing's too hard for God. Behold, I am the Lord. The God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Thus says the Lord. Who's your final authority? Mine is God. If he's alpha in the beginning, if he's the first and the last, that settles it. 
there's no in between. If he said it in the beginning and he said it in the end, that settles it. He's not changing. You can add and multiply and subtract and divide and calculate all the in-betweens. But I'm standing. I'm setting. I'm resting. I'm worshiping. I'm dependent upon the Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end. And that settles it. So whatever you say means nothing when it comes to what God says. My authority comes from God and God alone. Let's get ready to bring this to closure. Let's bring this to closure. Let me give you a visualization. Let me give you a word fitly. Displayed as apples. In a portrait. Be displayed. Let me let me let me, let me just give you a, an eloquent. representation. Let me give you a word fitly spoken like apples of gold and pictures of silk. Let me give you an imagery. All of that is talking about an imagery. Words can produce an imagery. Imagery can produce an, a picture, a representation of thought that can picture. Let me picture something for you. Jesus standing with his hands open and radiance and glory being a lamp and a light with a heart of compassion, mercy and patience and loving kindness. Giving you an opportunity to come unto him so that you might learn from him, so that you might experience love from him, so that you might receive eternal life from him, to know who he truly is, the Lord, the God above all flesh, that nothing is too hard for him. Some of you, you need to be reminded, God will never give you more than you can bear. There is nothing too hard for God. I don't care how old you are or how young you are. There is nothing too hard for God. Nothing too hard for God. Nothing. I don't know what you're in. I don't know what you're going through. But there's nothing too hard for God. I don't know what the world is trying to make this about. But there's nothing too hard for God. Sometimes you're going to have to close the door to the world and get in a secret place with the Lord and let them work it out on your behalf. There is nothing too hard for God. He's standing there waiting for you to let him put his loving arms around to comfort, strengthen, 
heal, deliver, impart, and allow you to experience his nothing that is too hard for him to handle. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. There is nothing in this world that you should be comparing him to. He's above the world. His holiness is not of this world. His righteousness is not of this world. His knowledge is not of this world. His wisdom is not of this world. His understanding is not of this world. His love is not of this world. His power is not of this world. His words are not of this world. This world cannot explain him, nor can this world contain him. He's omnipresent. He's omnipotent. And he's omniscient. The world cannot receive him because they know not of him. You can't even compare this world to him, but he created the world. And he can allow himself to use anything in this world. to accomplish his will. And so you can't even see him except you seek him and desire him to manifest himself in the way that will be fitly for you to know who he is. Do you know that there's nothing too hard for this God? Fret not thyself because of evildoers. Neither be envious at the wicked. For there shall be no reward to the evil. The candle of the wicked shall be put out. Evil is not too hard for God to come back and eradicate. Righteousness exalts a nation. God's righteousness, not humanity's righteousness, not an institution righteousness, not an organization righteousness, not a people righteousness, not a flag righteousness, not a color righteousness, not a family righteousness. Not a culture, righteousness, but God, righteousness. The Lord God that's above all flesh, all principality, all spirits, his righteousness exalts a nation. But sin, disobedience, provocation. Dishonor, lack of following his teaching and instruction, rebellion, and abomination, defilement is a reproach to any people.
God's blessing is from him. And you will never be able to change God's blessing. He blesses his people with rest upon their life. Rest from the weariness of concern. Rest from the constant strife and contention of wickedness and evil. Rest from foolishness. Hands that don't fear God, that don't honor God, that have self agendas because of who God is. He blesses and gives you rest from humanity's doing. Because this is the Lord that's above all flesh. Behold. Behold. Think about it. Behold. Some of you trying to behold what God is not telling you to hold. You have no understanding when he says behold. That's used many times in scripture. Behold. It's used in a way to say look and see. To draw attention to something that is significant or to emphasize a point. Pay attention. Look closely at. Behold, I am the Lord. Pay attention to God. Look closely at the ways of God. See God's ways. See God moving over situations that nothing is too hard for him. The God of all flesh. Pay attention to this God. Don't get into provocation. Don't get into personal agendas. Don't get into self-will. Pay attention to this God of all flesh. Look closely at his prince. Draw close to his heart. And know there is nothing too hard for him. Something that we fail to behold. What's impossible with humanity is only made possible with God. Only God can withhold. Only God can execute. Only God can know. Behold, see God's everlasting covenant, his divine consistency, his goodness, his steadfastness, his favor, his blessing upon your life. There is nothing too hard For God. And sometimes we're looking at the wrong things. We're not looking 
unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That's why God gives us an admonition to behold, to pay attention to the author and finisher of our faith, to pay attention to the bright and morning star, to pay attention to his precepts, to pay attention to his commandments, to pay attention to his instructions, to pay attention to his heart, to pay attention to his wisdom. And no, there is nothing too hard for God. If you know there's nothing too hard for God, then you'll take anything you could ever go through to God. And you will lay it at the altar knowing if anybody can do it, God can. Let us pray. Father God, in the precious name of Jesus, once again, you've comforted through your instruction. You showed us in the writing of Jeremiah how you allow wicked nations to have control over your people. You put them in their hand, knowing they were evil and unrighteous, that they would be used as a rod of chastisement, a rod of discipline for their falling away, their abomination their failure to hold on to your teaching and your instruction, their failure to acknowledge you, to keep you first in your heart, in their heart, their failure to keep their kids from Molech and to remain away from abominations, their failure over self-will and flesh, when they should have been seeking you. And we thank you for the chastisement and discipline for what they had learned from their waywardness. You restored, upheld your covenant promise, your loving kindness, your faith. your righteousness back unto their life. And they learned a very valuable lesson. Don't ever provoke you. Don't ever defile what you have graciously given and dishonor you in name nor deed. Acknowledge and trust you and you'll guide you be a lamp and a light unto their pain. You'll keep them in remembrance of who you are. You're the God that nothing is too hard for you to do. You're the God that no nation can come up against you. No kingdom can exceed. No principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness and rulers and darkness could ever prevail. You're the God that existed from the very beginning. And you're the God that will be there from the very end. Behold. Pay attention. Be sensitive. Look for. Desire. Seek. Because you're there. And you are sincere in all your ways. You're faithful instead.
And so we thank you, Father, for the warning and the encouragement. Nothing is too hard for you. Nothing. Nothing is too hard. Nothing. No matter what may come our way, nothing is too hard for you. What's impossible with humanity is only made possible with you. Because nothing is too hard for you. So, Father, we pray that you have your will. That you evaluate make known what is not pleasing in your sight and you remove because nothing is too hard for you that you bring all under subjection to your perfect will because nothing is too hard for you. that you lead in God unto holiness because nothing is too hard for you that you keep and present with exceeding joy because nothing is too hard. That you keep in remembrance of who you are because nothing is too hard. Make us perfect because nothing is too hard. Let us be found to the praise of your glory because nothing is too hard. Let the very words that we speak be words that you have formed in these earthly vessels because nothing is too hard for you. Let everything we say and do be so pleasing to you because nothing is too hard for you. Keep us in your very loving kindness because nothing is too hard for you. Provide in ways that we couldn't even imagine Give us more than we could even ask of or even think of because nothing is too hard for you. Let us never identify ourselves with the ways of the world, but with the spiritual manifestation of who and how we are identified and aligned with your wisdom because nothing is too hard for you. Thank you that we desire to see your sovereignty because nothing is too hard for you. And Jesus A name to be reverence. And honor. With the highest esteem. And acknowledge. With sincerity and gratitude. Because nothing. Is too hard for you. Amen. Amen. You are able to do it all. You are able to conquer all. You are able to create all. You're able to accomplish all things 
to reveal, to instruct. Because of who you are, there is nothing too hard for you. Nothing. Nothing. Amen. 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 Nothing is too hard for you. Oh, God. Hmm. Thank you, God. 